Okay, welcome back. This is the solution set for the two problems that we discussed in the gravitation lecture today. So let's, without further ado, let's go over to the first problem, which is up in the top left of the screen in tiny fashion. The first thing that we're going to try to do is find Jupiter's mass. This is fairly straightforward because we remember that we can use Newton's second law, um, uh, uh, his law of universal gravitation, to derive basically Kepler's second law, which says that g times the mass of the object at the center of the system, which in this case is Jupiter, times the period of the object in motion squared is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed, where r is the distance between the objects from center to center. So let's identify what that r then is actually going to be. R here is going to be the 1.07 times 10 to the 9 meters plus 2.6 times 10 to the 6 meters. That way we're incorporating <coughs> fully um, from center to center. Okay, if we take that then and we just do out some algebra, remember that the period here is given as 7.154 Earth days. Earth days is a very bad unit, so we have to calculate the period is 7.154 days. We need to get this to seconds. So we know that in one day, there is 24 hours. And we know that there is 60 minutes in one hour. And we know that there are 60 seconds in one minute. And upon doing that, then we see that days cancels days, minutes cancels minutes, hours cancels hours, and we're left with just seconds, which here is going to be 6,118, 106 seconds. And that's a number that we can now square and put into the formula. We have r, we have pi squared, so we can just do our algebra now and solve for the mass of Jupiter. And we see that the equation that we're going to use is the mass of Jupiter is going to be 4 pi squared r cubed, where we've identified what the r is, divided by g times the period squared, where we've identified what the period is. And if we plug in all these numbers and be extremely careful with parentheses when putting them into your calculator, I get somewhere around 1.9 times 10 to the 27 kilograms. And as a gut check, we know that that's much, much larger than the mass of the Earth. It's also smaller than the mass of the Sun, so at least we know by a gut check that we're in the right ballpark. And that is the mass of Jupiter. Part B says, what if we were to uh, want to find the orbital velocity? Well, that's just going back a step in Newton's second law, namely saying that we know that ma is equal to our capital G M1 M2 over R squared. But we also know that that is just V squared times M, oops, I apologize, M1 over R, because this is a centripetal acceleration. So another way of saying that is that if we cancel the M1s, then G mass of the object at the center, which in this case, again, is Jupiter, which we now have the mass of Jupiter, divided by r is equal to v squared, because I've canceled, oops, I've canceled the mass 1, and I've also canceled one of the r's. And so from that, we can simply take the square root of both sides, such that v is going to be the square root of capital G, mass of Jupiter, divided by r, R is the same R that we identified from part A. The mass of Jupiter is the mass of Jupiter that we found in part A. And capital G, of course, is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. So we see that this number then comes out to be about 10,903 meters per second. Last but not least, if we want to find the acceleration due to gravity of Ganymede, well, we can do this very straightforwardly by just knowing that the force of gravity is capital G M1 M2 over R squared. And so if we're talking about, and of course this is equal to M2A, the mass that's moving. So we know then that if we want to figure out the acceleration that an object is undergoing, okay, and we're close to the surface of the Earth, then we can write this acceleration 
as just g mass of the object in question, which in this case is Ganymede, divided by r squared, where this is going to be the radius of Ganymede, because we're talking about right near the surface of Ganymede. And if we remember that when we did this for the Earth, we knew that acceleration due to gravity on the Earth was just g mass of Earth divided by radius of Earth squared. Now, I remind you of this because at this point, since we know the mass of Ganymede and we know the radius of Ganymede, we can just do a straight plug and chug here. But I want to do this as a proportion just to make our lives a little bit easier and just to work through some of the algebra. So let's do that. So if we want to know the acceleration and we know that g mass of Ganymede divided by radius of Ganymede squared, and we know from above in the way that the problem was stated that the mass is about 0.025. So we have the mass of Ganymede is about 0.025 mass of the Earth. And we also know, we also know that um, the radius is 2,634.1 kilometers. But we also know the radius of the Earth. So we can get the ratio of that, namely the radius of the Earth is... Or, I'm sorry, we can make our lives a little bit easier by just saying then that if we can get the ratio that the radius of Ganymede is just the radius of the Earth divided by 2.42. And all that I did there was just figure out what the ratio of radius of Earth to radius of Ganymede is. And so using these relationships, we can plug them into the equation over here. And so we see that the acceleration due to gravity then is capital G times the mass of Ganymede, which is 0.025 mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of Ganymede, which is, let's just carry this out one step further. This is the same as the radius of the Earth times 0.413, because 1 divided by 2.42 is about 0.413. And so if we carry this out over here, then we get a 0.413 mass of Earth inside the square. And so we square that out, and we get 0.025 divided by 0.413 squared is about 0.17 times g mass of Earth divided by radius of Earth squared. And we identify that number as little g. So we can now plug in and just simply solve for 0 0.025 divided by 0.7 times 9.81 is about 1.44 meters per second squared. And we have exactly what we wanted, and that completes the problem. Okay, so for problem two, we're dealing with two different satellites at two different orbits, two different heights, two different masses, um, but they're both going in circular velocity around a central object, which here is a planet. So that means that all of our equations of circular motion are valid, and we can go right back to the beginning of these and say that we know that the force of gravity is g, mass of the object that's at the center, which I'll call the planet, mass of the satellite that's moving, divided by the radius of the satellite squared, which for a moving satellite is the same as the mass of satellite, v squared over r in circular motion. And we see that the mass of the satellite will cancel, meaning that the satellite mass for this problem is going to be completely irrelevant. Okay? So if we then cancel out one of the radii, we get back to the equation that we had a minute ago for orbital velocity, namely that for either of the satellites, the velocity of the satellite is going to be the square root of g, mass of the planet, divided by its respective distance. Now the problem here is that they did not give us anywhere in here the mass of the planet. However, they gave us enough information about object 1 to use that to find the mass of the planet. Let's just write that all out. So if I do object one in green, so satellite one, we see that V1 would be the square root of G mass of one divided by R1. I'm sorry, that should be mass of the planet. But if we put a check mark next to what we know and what we don't know and underline what we don't know, we know the velocity, we obviously know G, we know R1. We don't know the mass of the planet. That's one equation and one unknown. We can solve that one for the mass of the planet. What do we have for satellite 2? 
Well, it's the same planet, but we don't have the orbital velocity. In fact, that's what we ultimately want. But that's going to be the square root of g, mass of planet divided by r2. So our strategy then is going to be to use the info from satellite 1 and use this into satellite 2. So if we solve the equation for satellite 1 for the mass of the planet, first we'll have to square both, both sides. And so we see that v1 squared would equal g times the mass of the planet divided by r1. And then I cross multiply and get the fact that the mass of the planet then is going to be r1 v1 squared divided by capital G. Now, if I then take that mass of the planet and plug it into the equation for number 2, this then gives us that v2 is going to be the square root of capital G mass of planet divided by r2, which is the square root of capital G over r2, and we plug in the mass of the planet, which is r1 v1 squared divided by capital G. The g's cancel. We have a v1 squared, which can be pulled out, so we get a v1 square root r1 over r2. We now have everything listed out in terms of the variables that were given in the problem, namely v1, r1, and r2, and so we are just left now to plug this into the calculator. Again, the masses were a red herring here, so we did not need to use them. Please again be careful in plugging in these numbers into your calculator. But this gives us two similar but different enough problems that basically spans the entire set of this week's homework. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, never stop thinking.